All right, everybody, we will begin. Um, welcome back. Get your food, come to the front, come to the front, come to the front. All right. Uh, we're going to do, we're going to talk about 3D echo and a little bit of interventional stuff. Some disclosures that I don't think matter for this talk. Um, a lot of sonographers in the room, so we will discuss a little bit about acquisition, acquisition, uh, and then we'll show some examples of how we're using this stuff. So there is a guideline that you should know about. It's um, basically the ASE European Society guideline on 3D echo acquisition, um, published 2012. So some of the first few slides uh, we'll be showing you are from this. Uh, I also need to credit Dr. Roberto Lang. He, uh, he is sort of, the, I consider him the master of 3D Echo, and he shared a lot of his great slides uh, with me for, the, for me to share with you. So um, slides that you may not have seen me show before are probably because they're Dr. Lang's who's given them to me. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the basics of 3D Echo, and then we'll talk about some, ap some applications. So here's a little video. It's hopefully this place for you all. All right. So really the fundamental difference, 2D Echo is pixels being displayed on a digital screen. 3D Echo is voxels, which uh, are, it's a volumetric image. Um, historically, this is how you create an image. You send out a signal package, it hits the data set, it bounces back, um, and that's sort of a 2D slice. And this is a, a bit of a historic slide, but the, the fundamental physics of 3D Echo is unchanged. This is still how we get the data sets. We send out volume packets of data, they hit the target, and you get back a volume. Uh, how well you stitch together those little sub-volumes, and I'll go over that a bit again for you, how big those actual volumes are. A lot of that is being improved upon with uh, software uh, and hardware improvements. Um, but 3D Echo has been commercially available now for over 10 years. Um, it's probably in version 2.0 or 3.0, depending on which vendor. Uh, but it certainly has come a long way. So we'll keep going a little bit. So, so as we look at how this volume manipulates, this little video shows us. So it starts with sort of a triangle or a pyramid of data. You can, this is an example showing four subvolumes, so four EKGs, four consecutive beats where data is acquired from one beat, that creates a part of the image. The data from the next beats are acquired. So you get the representation of one thing, but the derivation of that data came from four different beats. So that's where stitching or high volume rate imaging, that's where the concept comes from. Now what we do is we make a lot of choices in the, the data we try to acquire, and then ultimately the data we display. So if you need a high volume acquisition, even today with most of the commercial payers of the commercial software, sorry, you still need to dial up some stitching. Um, so if, for example, you want to make very sure you've captured a ventricle and you've got in systole, you really want to make sure you get in systole. If your volume rate is only four or five hertz or voxels, you may not get that. Um, if your volume rate is 15, by stitching together a little bit, that increases your volume rate. That'll ensure you've got the temporal resolution to capture all of the events, for example, in systole. If you're looking at a wiggling mass, uh, you know, a thrombus, uh, an endocarditis vegetation, something, and you want to actually look at its motion, which is a temporally um, intense thing, then you need high volume rate. So depending what you want to see, if you only care about a ventricle's end diastolic dimension, then you only need one image at end diastole. So that's very easy to get. So there you need no you know, temporal resolution for. So it really depends on what question you're trying to answer with the data. Okay, so here's, you know, and the, there's still this misconception that if the 2D images are bad, let's just grab a 3D echo and then you can, you know, crop and dice and do things with the 3D to improve the image quality. Absolutely, that's false. So if the 2D images are bad, the 3D images are bad. So great 2D can make, you know, you can get great 3D if you've got great 2D. Uh, but it's not a solution for image quality by any stretch. So some of the concepts uh, in the interventional suite, we use actually all of these. There's this notion of a narrow volume where it's the entire width of the pyramid. That's kind of a default setting in most of the vendors. But it's not very thick. And that's graphic on the left. It's 60 degrees wide, but it's only 30 degrees deep. 
So sometimes that's all you need. In contrast, the one that's used on the Philips platform, it's called 3D Zoom. That's a misnomer. It doesn't have to be zoomed. It simply means that you've set the sector size to be exactly what you want. In this case, the very middle of the volume, you set a little 30 by 30, so that's all you're capturing. But in the interventional world, we all the time will max the sector uh, and then drop the depth a little bit. So really, it's, it's more equivalent to a pre-cropped. It allows you to crop ahead of time what it is you want to see, but it doesn't necessarily have to be small. So zoom is probably not the best thing, but we, we refer to it as sort of a pre-crop tool. Uh, and then finally, the big pyramid, the 90 by 80 or 90 by 90, um, that's really only used for, to get a whole ventricle. Uh, it doesn't really have much other application. So I'll show you an example. This is a little a beating version of what's the narrow volume. So your valves are in there, and you can sort of take that data set. And if you just want to get a sense of where the aortic valve and, and mitral valve line up, or if there's an, a mid sort of anterior mitral leaflet thing, and you want to see it in relation to the aorta, uh, that's really all you need. It's sort of like a, a thick peristernal long shot. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're not sure if you've got it in that, unlike a 2D, 2D is just one slice with no thickness effectively. 3D gives you, you can rotate the data set and you can set that at 30 degrees, which might equate to a centimeter and a half or so of width. So that's the narrow volume method. And all of the vendors, and, and some name or another, have that ability. Okay. And this is the one I was showing you, zoom mode it's often called, but it's, you know, not the best term. Same idea, you set the sector of whatever you want. Um, in the early days of 3D Echo, the big problem was you would get these massive volumes and then you'd have to spend half an hour cropping it. And you crop to your drop and then everybody got frustrated and nobody did it anymore. Um, this is the solution. You basically just set the sector on the one thing you want to see. Uh, and then there's nothing, you don't have to crop anything because you've only captured what you were interested in. And the width of this is whatever you set it to be. So this is a sort of a transthoracic view looking at the mitral valve. <laughs> Uh, no cropping required. So that's really what zoom mode means, is no cropping required if you set it properly. Recognizing the wider you make it, the lower your temporal resolution. So that's kind of the trade-off. And then the next one is, yeah, this is sort of the, the sort of indications for that zoom mode. You know, you want to see the specifics on a, on a mitral valve, that's where we use it very often, prolapse, flail, perforation, stenosis, that kind of stuff. Um, it's less prone to artifacts because you're not stitching at all. Typically, the default is a single beat, usually because it's kind of small. Uh, you get a reasonable frame rate. A lot of, you hear me mention frame rate a lot because a lot of in, there's a lot of processing time to uh, to acquire and, and create a 3D picture. So the wider you are, the less samples you can get per unit time. So if it's very narrow, you can get a fairly good frame rate. As soon as you start to widen it out, your frame rate drops uh, very quickly. And then this is probably, this is how the, we started with, you know, that's just gain is high, capturing everything conceivable in this 3D volume. Uh, generally useful only for the ventricle, um, if you want to see sort of, a, you know, something at the LV apex, or if you want to get a ventricular volume. For that, it is actually useful. And this is sort of the, the theoretic advantage over a 2D is that, you know, you can, even if your 2D display doesn't show the true apex, as long as you've put your pyramid of volume in a reasonable place, the apex, the true apex exists in the volume, and then after the fact, uh, as you sit at your workstation, you can go find it. So that's kind of the 3D. And then you can look in short axis or long axis or whatever you need. The true utility of that is really in probably EF determination and ventricular volume assessment. Okay. And this is what I talked about. Uh, you know, the, the fundamental concept is single beat or multi beat. All of the vendors will now tell you that, um, you know, our product has single beat. Single beat, high frame rate. You don't need to stitch. Stitching is a problem. If you have uh, an, uh, an awake person uh, who can't hold their breath, and particularly if they have AFib, so it's either RR variability with arrhythmia or it's heart motion with respiration. Those are your two sources of challenge with stitching. Uh, if it's a vented patient uh, in sinus rhythm, you can get beautiful stitched images. If it's an ambulatory patient who can't hold their breath, you're going to get artifacts. Um, and the main trade-off is temporal resolution. So the, the vendors will tell you, we have a solution now. It's high volume rate, single beat. And that's all true. But what the trade-off is in the, the background is that you're losing some of that the spatial resolution. So yes, the volume rate is high, but the image gets a little grainy and the endocardial resolution gets a little weaker. So there's always a compromise somewhere. So it really depends on what are you trying to achieve with the images. 
Um, so multi-beat gets a large volume, uh, useful for chamber quantification, gets you the frame rate. But as I mentioned, uh, beware of the stitching. So this is, a little, uh, this is a little video from Dr. Lang about uh, the next one here about the importance of frame rate, okay? So in this little video, we have a politician who's coming to the edge of a cliff with a low frame rate. We're sampling the story not very often, and you really don't know what happened. Okay, that's, that's a nice example of a low frame rate story. So sample, wait, wait again. This is high frame rate. You know what happens. So <laughs> same story, more samples, fuller picture. Now you know what's happening. So that's the, the graphic for the, the importance of frame rate. Okay. So how do we, how do we balance these things? So the more sub-volumes you have, which basically means stitching, the higher the frame rate. So there's some examples. So the one at the top has 20 hertz, and that is uh, four sub-volumes. The one on the bottom, across the bottom, your, your volume rate is 35 hertz, uh, but that took six beats. So that's just an example of how you get from 20 to 35. Add some, add some stitching. Uh, the other important thing is depth. Okay, so again, the depth is you've got to wait longer. You, you actually end up having some, uh, some spectral broadening. Um, so the deeper you go, uh, the less frame rate you're going to have as well. So basically, the stitching here is the same. Depth of 13 centimeters gets 35 hertz. Depth of 16 centimeters gets 30 hertz. So all this comes down to, you know, decide what it is you're trying to capture in your image and set up the image for that purpose. So if you're trying to show the LV, you don't need to have the depth all the way back to see the back wall of the atria. That's just adding more depth for nothing. It's costing you volume, right? And you haven't added any new data. Okay. So this is the ECG gating. That's sort of how that gets put together. So you see these stitches. Those are the individual sub-volumes actually being captured and created to make one volume. And it may not look too bad from the side, but once you turn the data set and look down sort of the long axis of the sub-volumes, particularly if you're trying to see an aortic or mitral valve, then the stitching actually becomes a problem. So some, you know, stitching by itself is not a failure. Uh, for some um, purposes, like an LV volume determination, the stitching is no big deal. But if you're trying to follow a mass on a mitral valve, it will cripple your image. So it depends what you're trying to achieve. Um, the other thing on 3D is it's very gain sensitive, um, even more so than 2D. We all know that in 2D you can dial up and down gain. Um, in 3D you can do it at the time of acquisition, but you can also do it post uh, when we're looking at workstations. And this just video just kind of goes through the, the difference. So when there's high gain, the ventricle looks like a snowstorm and you can't see anything in between. And when you dial down the gain, it gets this kind of moth-eaten look where everything disappears. So the sweet spot is in between, of course. The sweet spot tends to be, most of us will, would adjust gain to when you can see the blood volume, that's too much gain. So you turn down the gain, or you turn up the gain until you see blood volume. As soon as there's something in the blood pool that shouldn't be there, then that's as much gain as you need. Okay. And then basically, the, you know, what are the, the display modes with 3D? There's this volume rendering I've shown you a lot of. That's what we typically use. That's kind of our working view for a lot of interventions. Surface rendering, not particularly useful. Uh, it's okay if you want to sort of superimpose what you've measured on top of a still or beating image, and you really want to check how well is it lining up with the contours of what I'm seeing versus what got measured. That's sort of a limited application of the surface rendering. The wireframe, same kind of idea. You can see the volume that gets measured by the computer or by the software and you can still see the B mode endocardial resolution. It gives you a way to sort of say, did the computer get it right? Is the software accurate? And then finally, the multi-slice. So that's sort of, that's all I was gonna go over on transthoracic 3D. Um, a lot of what we do is, is and so the workhorse for 3D is interventional or is at least in TE. So on the mitral valve, for the faculty and, yeah, a few. Yep. So, have, have there been any parallels learned as to when do you, when you have acquired and got it in EF that you can trust? You know, so you get a number, you always get a number. Yeah, yeah. The question is, are there some tricks that can tell you if you, if you, if A, B, C came okay, you can trust them? 
I think, it, well, most of the time when there's an error in the, in the automatic tracking or, the, or failure to correct the tracking is at the apex. The apex is often what gets missed. The base and lateral walls, and most of that's actually pretty good. The technical things for a, a 3D acquisition of the ventricle, the LV, is don't be overly deep. So get rid of the atria, because that's just costing you frame rate for nothing. Uh, don't necessarily capture the RV in the same image if you don't need it. So the wider you are, without need, the more you're costing frame rate and, and re all kinds of resolutions. So really set the sector to capture only what's needed. And then most of the software, um, you know, has a sort of be where you believe is the apex. If you're off by a few degrees, that's not a big deal because the data still should be there and you can correct it. But it really comes down to practicing with the software. I mean, the EF often looks good. The EF might, you know, so that, you know, EF's 50. That's, that's about what my eyeball thought, except the volumes are way off. You've got an end systolic volume of 25 and an end diastolic volume of 50, which doesn't make any sense when you see the rest of the heart. So one of the challenges we see is that the, the sort of mental step of do these volumes make sense? Uh, the EF often is fine, but the absolute volumes aren't, and that's typically because a big part of the apex was missed. So it, it's a matter of training, you know, it's uh, calibrating through other methods. You know, if your stroke volume is such, then it should correlate with your LVOT Doppler stroke volume and sort of putting all that together. Um, in studies that have done a lot of 3D with good kind of rigorous technical application of how to get it, it is very reproducible and it looks good versus MRI. Um, but if you just apply the software and don't correct it and try to get better with it, it's not going to be good. Somebody actually uses 3D, yep. but actually traced it because that's when they discovered that if you traced keeping the papillary muscles out of it, you got better correlation. Yep. So that's the most classic paper that even oh, So that's the more heavy from Chicago. So it's, not, it's not reality. Well, that, that's part of the problem is the software knows that. I mean, that paper is 10 years old. People know that that is the way it should be done is that you shave the trabeculations. So don't include trabeculations as myocardial thickness. You make trabeculations be part of the, the, the cavity volume instead. And when you do that, the correlation with MRI and 3D echo becomes much better. Otherwise, 3D echo is always smaller than MRI. So it's the trabeculation choice calling it ventricle or calling it cavity. So the answer is call it cavity, shave it off in the trace. Um, most software, I mean the variable, the software from the different vendors knows that. So what they're trying to do is not trace the blood trabeculation border, they're trying to trace the, tra the trabeculation to myocardial border. That's what they should be doing. But that is a source of error, absolutely. Are there any poor correlations made with the software? There's a lot of different software, yeah, there's a lot actually. <laughs> there's, that was the most famous one, it was the first one, but there's, there's probably half a dozen studies comparing 3D echo to MRI. And, you know, if you do that method, they do, they do work. All right, so uh, TE, this is, mitral is probably the workhorse for TE. Uh, same thing, uh, you know, you have to make sure you set the width broad enough to capture what you're interested in. Um, and that's usually the point. So the volume is very adjustable on a T as well. So in the, the 2D images, you have to set that. See, not only am I going to have the mitral valve in the middle, but on the right screen, typically, as you set up that image, you have to dial the width so that the, the sector size is wide enough to get the entire mitral valve. That's the most common error is not adjusting the width. And then, you know, you get these images. This is what we've seen. Standard nomenclature, this is an aortic valve at 12. Um, it is real important for the, the faculty, you know, that when we capture this, and, uh, you know, the, the plea is to please any valve case, capture this. Uh, we had a case last week that with the effect, the, the patient was sent specifically for mitral valve evaluation for balloon valvuloplasty, and no 3D acquisition of the valve was, was captured. Um, so it was not, not the way it's supposed to happen. So if you're a fellow or a faculty, and it's a valve case, or my, my practice is every single mitral, every single TE I do, I get a 3D of the valve. As much for practice to make sure you're still getting it right and you're doing it the way you want. Um, but it, it's basically standard and expect, expected now, 3D valve. And that's the, that's the way you present it. Uh, I like this little cartoon. It's got the P1. Remember the nomenclature is moving from lateral to medial, one, two, three. But this actually has this little commissural leaflet piece, which is a real thing. 
Sometimes it's that little commissural piece that actually prolapses, causes your MR, and occasionally is a target for a mitroclip. So um, the last piece of medial meat isn't always P3. Sometimes there's another little piece. Okay? But that's, that's the presentation of the mitral valve, not this presentation. All right. So here's, you know, this is a little movie about um, imaging the mitral valve. That's the way you do it. See how the mitral valve is kind of flat? The, if you drew a line across the annulus there, it's flat. And that really is the key to a good quality mitral picture. If the annulus is all tilted in your view, when you add 3D, you're going to have you know, part of it's going to be missing. So in the two views, you want to have the mitral annulus be as flat as you can across the views. And then you set this sort of zoomed image or pre-cropped image just in what you're interested in. You do a little rotation with the ball to move it forward and another clockwise rotation to put the aortic valve at 12, and that's it. So it's really three steps. It's, you know, you, you, four. Maybe you get the, the annulus flat, you set the sector, you acquire the image, you roll it forward to look off fast, and then you counterclock it to put the aortic valve at 12. Four steps, and that, that's all it takes. Okay? So I would say, and we've talked about this before, you know, good mitral valve imaging can be achieved 90 plus percent of the time for these patients. The aortic valve in 3D is tougher, same principles. Um, you know, you set the sectors to see a good long axis and short axis view. Uh, you set the volume that you want to capture in this zoom or pre-cropped, just small enough to show what you want. You know, if you're trying to show the entire ascending aorta or all of the mitral valve, then it's going to affect your image quality. So again, you just rotate it to sort of usually, usually the display is from the aorta looking down on the valve. Um, and the relationship between the esophagus and the aorta is not as consistent and easy as it is with the mitral. So you should get a good 3D aortic valve, I would say, 60 to 75 percent of the time. Not as good as mitral, but it's, it's never good if you don't try and try to get better at it. And then, of course, you've got the orientation. You know, with every 3D volume, you can display it from one side or the other, particularly for valves. So you can display it from the LVOT, you display it from the atria. Um, the one caveat is when you're capturing a data set, capture enough of something else so you know where you are. So if you're capturing the mitral, get just enough aorta that you can orient yourself. Um, it's not as bad on a native valve because you've always got the, you know, the, the smile and you can figure out anterior from posterior. But if you get a beautiful zoom view of a bioprosthetic valve that's completely circular and symmetrical, and then you have PVL, for example, you can see here's a beautiful cir circular valve. Here's a bad thing. But in reality, where does all this relate to the heart if you don't have some other anatomy, like the aortic valve or the appendage? Those are sort of the anchors. They're always in the same place. The aortic valve is 12, the appendage is 10. If you've got those in your image, you know where you are. If you don't have any of those, you can get lost. Um, so I'll show you sort of some examples of how we use this stuff. Uh, I use the MitraClip. We could use PV plugging. We could use tricuspid. You could use any intervention to sort of demonstrate how we use 3D. Um, we'll, we'll do the MitraClip. This is just a reminder that, you know, in the pivotal studies of the mitroclip, it was, a, it was supposed to be a primary or a dysfunction or a degenerative valve study, but actually about 27%, call it 30% of those enrolled had, had secondary or functional MR. So there's quite a lot of functional MR. Despite that 30% inclusion of FMR, uh, the FDA did not approve it for, the, for FMR. So its only approval is for primary MR. So here's a case. Um, he was referred to us for MD, MD Anderson, um, fairly young guy, multiple brain tumors with some dyspnea. Um, multiple brain tumors is uh, enough for the surgeons not to want to do a sort of extensive pump run with a valve repair or valve replacement. You can see here on the long axis view, uh, there's a, an impressive flail of P2. So A2 comes off the aortic valve, the one opposite that is P2, a big flail. I hope, I'm not sure it projects as well as it looks on my laptop. You don't really need the color, but I show it anyway. If you've got a flail gap that big, you know there's severe MR. The thing that we do uh, before is a septal targeting. So this is an application of X-plane imaging. It looks like 2D, but the derivation of this is from a 3D probe. And typically what we do is we have to sort of measure how high off the annulus do we want to be. Um, we measure that out. It's about four and a half centimeters typically. And recognizing it's four and a half centimeters from where we think it's going to end up. So if it's a big prolapsing case like this one, there's a good chance the new co-optation zone will be slightly in the atria because you've got a lot of redundant tissue and you've already got prolapse. In contrast, if it's a case of tethered valve, secondary MR, lots of LV dysfunction with a co-optation zone is below the annulus, 
you have to adjust for that and think, okay, maybe I only want to puncture about three and a half centimeters. So there is a sort of fudge factor in the case of you have to anticipate where's the clip going to end up, and then you go about four and a half centimeters above that. But that sort of shows tenting on the RA and tenting in the RA from the other sort of X-plane image. Uh, this is a beating version. That's really what it looks like. Um, and when that's stable, one thing we've started doing, and the reason that's in this talk, is to show you how we use 3D. So we capture a 3D just of that's the setup. You put that volume on there, the zoom view, just on the septum where the tenting is. And you get this view of the fossa. And when you have this view of the fossa, you see the needle is right here. And that sort of thin tissue that looks like almost uh, you know, tissue paper, uh, all of that thin stuff is the fossa ovalis. And you can imagine a clock face on that. And then where we target is sort of between 12 and 2. That sort of superior, slightly posterior position on the fossa ovalis is where we want to target. So without a 3D looking from the left atrium directly on that, it's hard to be confident that's where you are. If you go too high, it's actually possible to, to enter this little fissure between the RA and the LA. So they come together. And then some folks, they have this little invagination that comes all the way down. And it's an unfortunate thing called an atrial stitch. You actually put the needle in, you go into the, the pericardial space from the RA, then back into the LA, and everything looks good. But you stick a big catheter across, and that tamponades your bleeding. And then when you're all done, you take out everything, and now the hole is real, and you get a hemopericardium. So going too high is a problem. So this is one of the ways that you ensure you don't go too high, is you enter exactly where you mean to. And that's all very sort of nuanced, very focused 3D zooming to get there. Okay, and this is another example of somebody who just had excessive tenting. This, you know, pushing and pushing and pushing, and the needle wouldn't go across. And this is somebody who'd had multiple previous pulmonary vein ablations, lots of times across the septum by, by uh, EP, all scar. This guy actually required a, a coronary balloon. So a little needle, a, um, some cautery, and then a coronary balloon to actually blow it up uh, and create a tear big enough to get a catheter across to do the microclipping. So, and the, the surgeon... I think uh, you put some bubbles or something to be sure that when you inflate the balloon, you were really in the Oh, yeah, we do. And actually, we, it's all guided by... We see the balloon on both sides. The case yesterday had exactly this as well. They had a beautiful dumbbell, a waist, on the coronary balloon that finally popped and ripped the septum. And it's... I think you hold your breath during those things, but it's... <laughs> Um, but again, the, the interventionalist has very little tactile feedback. They don't know that it's tenting this much. And they can just keep pushing, and ultimately the septum will rip, and that's a mess. Um, so it is important to sort of give that live guidance of, you know, how much tenting is there. Because too much is a rupture risk. All right, so here's a case again, um, the same case. Uh, so that gentleman we showed at the beginning, this is a 3D. He's got the big P2 uh, prolapse, uh, post mitral clip here. You know, one, one quick question while you're at it. Yeah. Because the images do get a little more blurry. I find it difficult at times to distinguish prolapse from clips. I mean, you see something coming at you, mm -hmm. but it's blurry. It's, you know, in the 2D, no big deal. The flare is a little deep yep. thing. Yep. But in the 3D, sometimes it's like. So, so I, I kind of make my mind first with the 2D, and then, of course, once you put the 3D, you yep. know it's a flare. So you know but if you just saw me in 3D alone, sometimes I, I'm not sure that I, that I know if it's prolapse versus flail. So that's a very good point. In this depiction, it can be hard because you can't tell if the, the, the edge is slipping back at you. So this is the standard display, but you're by no means limited to this view. So what we'll often do is just rotate it. You know, if it's coming at you like this and you're not sure, you can just take the data set and look at it this way. You can look sort of parallel right. to the co zone, and then you get a much clearer picture of it's doing this. So, the data is there. It doesn't always come across in this standardized view. This is a view to so everybody knows the anatomy. But you can, by all means, and we do that all the time, you flip it around and look from other views to really understand what's happening. Um, OK, so that's a case where uh, you know a mitral clip times two, and this is the final result. You don't see any MR. That's unusual. On a, tran on a transesophageal, there would be mild MR stuff. But this is a, a tougher case. We published this one in our uh, big journal. A few years ago, this is a, a different gentleman um, on the intercommissural view, which tends to show P2. Uh, There's a huge P2 prolapse on 3D. It's a very wide P2 scallop. 
Um, he actually took three microclips all lined up, and they kind of lined up one, two, three. Made one very broad tissue bridge, um, but you know, had a, and then we had a medial diastolic orifice and a lateral diastolic orifice. And sometimes when you put all these clips together, they create one functional bridge, or sometimes you can have little bits of flow between the clips. Depends how close you get, how close you get them to each other, and also how uh, sort of thick and rigid the tissues are. If it's really sort of thick calcified tissue, clips a centimeter apart will make one bridge. Uh, if it's very sort of thinner, friable tissue, you can have three clips and you'll still get a bridge between them. So there's a tissue dependency on what happens as well. Okay, so uh, different guy. 89-year-old, progressive dyspnea, coronary disease, he had a prior cab, um, prolapsed for several years, um, had been independent, and then just got progressively more short of breath, moved in with his daughter. High surgical risk because of previous sternotomy and age. So the first set of images, not obvious what the pathology is, because these first set of images tend not to show very well the P3 area. You have to go looking for it. Um, on a slightly off angle, you know, sort of intercommissural view, you see over here, this little bit of prolapse. You can see it a little bit, doesn't project well over there as well. So the mechanism we thought based on the 2D was probably P3. The color comes on, you see pulmonary vein flow reversal. So we're all pretty convinced it's severe. So we know the mechanism, we can confirm it. And this is exactly, Dr. Q, to your point, it's hard to see in this view. It's all moving fast. You're not quite sure. You're suspecting P3 anyway. Uh, pause it over here. This is just a still version. Uh, P3 is over here. And then we just rotated it around. So now we've got the aortic valve down here. And now we're looking sort of straight at P3. And you can see there's a big hole here. So P3 is the one that's lumped up, and you're sort of looking down the gun barrel of the, the anatomic defect. So not sure how well that projects, but we do a lot of that. And for the fellows, I mean, the distinction between flail and prolapse, okay? So here's your leaflet. If the leaflet tip is still pointing down, doesn't matter how big the body is going back into the atria. <coughs> if the tip is pointing down, that's prolapse. And as soon as the, the primary cords or the marginal cords that are supporting that tip rupture and the tip starts to point backwards, that's a flail. So it doesn't really describe how much tissue is going back into the atria. It's a description of the tip. If the tip is up, that's flail. If the tip is down, it's prolapse. But it's pretty hard to have flail and not have severe. So that's really where the, the, the term gets some use, usefulness. All right, so, and this is again the example of using the gain in 3D to your advantage. So this is a clip going in on the left. And as you start to cross the valve, what happens is you lose the valve, you lose the clip under the valve. Valve tissue is now on top of it, you can't see it anymore. But all you do on the right image is you turn down the gain. It makes the leaflet tissue disappear, but because the clip is so bright, you still see the clip. So now you know, basically, the image on the left is in the atria. The clip is in the atria. The image on the right, the clip is advanced into the ventricle, and you can, can, you can be confident that the orientation of the clip hasn't changed. So you know that when you bring it up and grab the leaflets, it hasn't moved on you. If you don't play with the gain, you wouldn't be able to see that. And there's just the capture. So again, in these cases, you go back and forth between 2D and 3D constantly. This is the mitra clip. You see the leaflets are starting to bounce a little bit, the anterior leaflet on the device. And then on the right image, you just bring it up. The leaflets are bouncing on the device. And then you just close the clip and grab them. And then this is uh, the first image in this same case. Doesn't look too bad, but when you see where P3 is, there's still a very dramatic uh, residual MR. So that would not be enough to be done. You think, well, I've got one clip on, but the outcome's not good. This is the 3D, so we have one tissue bridge in diastole. It's exactly where we wanted it to go because this was the P3. This was the prolapsing segment. We grab the prolapsing segment. This part looks good, but in systole, you see that there's still a big portion of residual prolapse further medial to where the clip went. So the clip is here, and medial to the clip, there's still a big chunk of prolapse. So now is the decision to put a second clip. So here's clip number one. So this is an example of an ultra zoomed view. We're only interested in one thing, getting that mitra clip to that tiny little space. That's all we care about at this particular time. And you don't want to bash clip one too hard because you can knock it off, and then you're no better off. So how is the communication between you and uh, uh, the <laughs> You say, 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 you say,
he's got, so the image is displayed for me, the image is displayed for him, and the language is basically, we know what anterior medial means. Um, now we do. <laughs> for early days, we confuse that more often than you'd like to know, but so you, you talk more medial, more lateral, medial lateral, medial lateral, anterior posterior, and then we just talk about clock face. Clock face rotation, rotate clockwise, rotate back, rotate clockwise, rotate back, and that's, that's the sort of the primary language of getting it around. And then the other thing, in this case, we have a term we would call arrowheading. So that's the, see, the arrowhead. So I'll explain, what, I'll explain what that means. This is clip one, fully deployed and released. It's independent now. You can't get that one back. This is clip two, going to go in here in this small little space between the medial commissure and clip number one. But that's too big in that configuration to get through the hole. So we say arrowhead it, meaning close it halfway. So it looks like an arrowhead. And then you go through. So when the, when you're, when the target you've got to go through is pretty small, you can't get a big fat clip through. So I sort of say it's a small hole, arrowhead, advance. And then when he's on the ventricle side, he opens it up again and grabs. So it's a pretty standard language, but it does take some, some time to sort of understand each other. Uh, and then there's the final. So that P3 was achieved. That's the you know, two or three little jets of residual MR in color. Um, that was deemed mild. And there you have uh, this. You can see the two sort of struts. That's the tissue bridge from the two clips. Um, and effectively, what we ended up doing was obliterating the medial part of the valve. So we don't have two diastolic orifices. We just have one large lateral orifice and no medial orifice. But in this case, that was fine. Mean gradient was two millimeters. So uh, that's how that ended. This is a different case. This is, this is a tough one fairly recently in the last couple of weeks. Um, this is somebody we did for, for mixed etiology. It's not entirely clear on that view. There's a lot of MR. Uh, by color, the systolic flow reversal in the left upper pulmonary vein. This view is pretty wild in terms of etiology. So you've got this tethered mid portion of the anterior leaflet. So you've got a strut cord that isn't long enough. So you've got LV dilation, remodeling, tethering of the secondary or strut cord to the mid portion of the anterior leaflet. But then you've also got prolapse over here. And it's probably true prolapse. It's not pseudo prolapse where the leaflet doesn't come past the true annulus. It actually looks like it's just probably exceeding the annular level. But when you look at 3D, it's confusing what's going on here. Same orientation. Medially, we've got prolapse. Laterally, we've got tethering. And there's a sort of a still shot of that. That's pretty hard to get all in. There are some folks who claim that all MR is either primary or secondary, and there's no such thing as a mixed etiology. This, this says otherwise. So there's your mixed, uh, there's prolapse, here's restriction. How do we approach that? The decision was, uh, you know, Sutton's law, you go where the money is. So there's a big piece of prolapse, that's where we go. Um, and that's what happened. Here's the prolapse. We put a clip right across here, targeting this big piece of prolapse. Uh, the color effect was good. This was a single mitra clip deployed, a little bit of residual. Um, you know, there's three little jets there, you know, collectively, how do we quantitate the MR of these three little jets? Okay, great. So that, that's what we were thinking, you know, do th three traces make mild, the three traces make moderate, who knows? But we look for other data. So this is the sort of the supportive data in this case, baselines across the top. So we started with systolic flow reversal. You know, when you get systolic flow reversal, <laughs> you usually also get a large or high volume or high velocity D wave because all of the forward flow has to occur in that diastolic phase. So the D wave tends to be high. After one clip, you have resurrection of the S wave, and the D wave velocity falls. So that's what you want to see. That's basically a normalization of the pulmonary vein. In addition, we're in the habit of measuring LVOT from a deep transgastric. So we get a VTI at 9 at the beginning, multiplied, doing the math based on his LVOT diameter. We had a calculated stroke volume of 35. And after augmenting forward flow with the clip, uh, VTI went to basically 15. So we had a 60% increase in the forward stroke volume from one clip. Uh, paradoxically, with a little reduction in the EF. And that's what you expect, because we've sort of revealed what the EF really does um, by augmenting forward flow. Okay? Um, another case. Which time we got? I'm doing all right. Okay, so this is another gentleman. This is tougher. This is somebody who has a prior mitral repair. You can see the surgical ring in profile here. There's a little posterior leaflet. It's not moving very much. That's pretty typical after a surgical repair. 
Um, we look at this, and you know, here's the anterior leaflet over here, and this is this totally frozen posterior leaflet. Um, we would actually consider uh, a clipping in this one because as long as there is a posterior leaflet, you can often grab it. This patient's concern was actually mild dyspnea but refractory hemolytic anemia. So this guy had an indication for potentially clipping, not necessarily to treat severe MR, but to actually treat potentially his hemolytic anemia. So on FAS, at this center, we know what this is. This is an attuned surgical ring. It's like an adjustable belt. The surgeon ties it in with um, a running stitch, but then there's one long suture. He can tie it up like a belt to cinch the whole thing down. After he pulls that suture, he throws 10 knots. Uh, and that makes this little mountain, this little tree of knots. And that's what shows up right here. So we've actually had these patients referred back to us with endocarditis um, because the re receiving hospital, or family doc, or not family doc, but the re receiving cardiology didn't know what this was. Patient has a fever, history of repair. Oh my God, there's something on the valve. Look back, that's just in a tune ring. That's okay. Um, so anyway, there's the surgical ring. There's the MR. Pulmonary vein flow does not have uh, clear reversal. Um, so it's safe to say it's probably at least moderate. It could be more. Um, we did uh, some, so that's why I'm showing this. So what do you do with the color? So this is the way we typically see the color when you first put it on. Um, what happens is the default is to have a low filter on the color. So the reason I'm showing you this is this is the simple fix for color. You have the same orientation. It's kind of a snowstorm. There's too much going on to be useful. Then all we do is one move. We increase the filter on the color. So uh, the default that shows up on about, is about two. You can't do it on the box. It's a QLab thing. I have not found a way to do it on the IE33. I don't know if the Epic has it or the next one have it, but I've looked for it. I haven't found a way to, sit, to reset what it does. But in QLab, it's very easy, a little slider bar. It starts at two, you just go from two to eight. And all that immediately sort of increases the filter, takes away all that noise you don't need to see. And now you've got a very clear, uh, get my arrow off there. And there's a little sort of MR right at P2. This is very, very valuable when we're doing paravalvular uh, plug repair and trying to find little identified leaks. You can't see it in that snowstorm of color, but when you adjust the filters, it's easy enough to find. Uh, and then this is an example. We did a vena contracta area in this particular case. We sort of came up with a solution that, you know, this, at the end of the day, we figured this was moderate MR, but he had refractory hemolysis. Um, and we thought, well, we could clip it. And we clipped it. Uh, the MR went from moderate to mild, but the, he the hemolysis was gone. So. Different, different target of therapy, but it worked. Um, this is a publication we had earlier this year uh, from our experience of uh, doing mitral clip after surgical repair. A lot of centers don't do that. They say, well, if you've had a surgical repair, you can't do a mitral clip anymore. So it's either redo surgery or uh, a valve and ring, which is a you know, transeptal, put a sapien valve inside this a complete surgical ring. That works. Um, it sometimes has a higher diastolic gradient, and it also compromises potentially the LBOT, because in that situation, you've still got the native anterior leaflet that you're now going to displace. So there's a concern with that. Um, and it, but it's always part of the conversation with these patients is redo surgery, valve and ring, or mitral clip. Um, so we published that. And it, basically what we showed was that, you know, against a cohort of patients who did not have prior surgery within the same timeline, we use it the same timeline because we clearly had a learning curve. And that would sort of negate the learning curve if they're all done on roughly the same time frame. Um, basically, there was no difference in procedure time, no difference in, in fluoroscopy time, no difference in 30-day outcomes. So kind of a small study, but basically said if you compared a, a dozen or so patients who had prior repair with, I think, about 50 who had no prior repair, the, uh, the acute outcomes were similar. So it's feasible to do it, and we keep doing them. Um, this is somebody with prior repair. Um, this, you see the surgical ring. And just showing the mean gradient was two at baseline, and after one clip was three uh, with a good outcome. We call that mild MR. Do you try to stay with one clip, or do you try to We try to always stay with one clip, but it, you, you, in these cases, you tend to run out of diastolic gradient. So one clip might get you a mean gradient of four or five. You're probably done. The big challenge, though, is if you have significant residual after one clip, we never know if the gradient is area dependent or flow dependent. Sure. So we always have this debate about. The nice thing with the second clip is you can put it on and test it. And take it out. Yeah. The, once you once you deploy the first clip, it's there. But the second clip is always attached. So we can yeah. put it on. If you get a nice result, and we've seen everything. We've seen 
Second clip goes on, that moderate to severe residual completely gone, and the mean gradient goes from seven to five. So paradoxical, you've made the area smaller, yet the gradient went down. We've also seen you, do, you feel great, you get rid of the MR, and the mean gradient goes to nine, and then you don't leave it. So it's, we, that's one of the big challenges, is how much, how much of the gradient is flow versus area. What's your threshold for gradient, five? No, it's about seven. It, it depends on the protoplasm and what their options are. But when you have a choice, um, if you can get no MR with a mean of seven in somebody who doesn't have a surgical option, we we'll usually accept that. Uh, yeah, yeah, and we've got, I didn't have time to put it, we've got a great study in the last month with a patient who was PACE dependent. So we brought the, um, the pacemaker tech in and they basically paced everything from 80, 70, 60, 50. And it was amazing to watch the gradient go from nine to seven to five to three, entirely rate dependent. That, that's actually very powerful. Um, and then finally, this is, you know, this is the, it's not really a dilemma, but this is usually the final shot of a clip, is you have your iatrogenic ASD. Um, if it's a left to right shunt, we leave it alone. If it's bidirectional, we think about it. Uh, if it's right to left, we close it. Um, and you have to factor in, do they have TR, pulmonary hypertension, RV dysfunction, but um, that's sort of the algorithm. So final slide, you know, with the mitral clip stuff, we define the target, you guide the transeptal, you have to do the clip position and orientation. Um, you have to confirm everything that worked out and you landed where you expected to. You evaluate the systolic and diastolic function of the device and the native valve. And occasionally you start over again uh, if you have to get another clip in. So um, I'll stop there. If you have questions, comments, interventional in general, 3D echo in general, echo in general. How long is it done for? It really depends on the makeup of those cases. Um, you know, I would say we've done probably 160, 170 total cases. I'd say the learning curve was fairly steep in the first 50. But Justin, you've probably done a lot. I mean, of the fellows in the room, you've probably done the most as a fellow. How many would, would, cases would you think you've been involved in so far? Okay. Are you feeling independent? Um, I, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> you would. I mean, you're going to keep learning as you go. And it's sort of, I mean, most people start just doing A2P2. A2P2 is the easiest thing because that's a cord free zone, right? There's no cords there. You can go A2P2 and you're not going to get tangled. As soon as you get away from A2P2, you're messing with cords and you're in this sort of nest of things that are going to interfere with the clip. And that's a little harder uh, post surgery and stuff. But I think A2P2 clips, somewhere between 25 and 50, is. Reasonable. Yeah. You had one of my cases. I was a lady that was very, very sick in Ukraine. And she had SAM. Oh, yeah. The real obstruction and body mass. She was in the ICU. Yeah, I remember her. And both the SAM and the mic were pure. So my question is have you had any more of those dynamic real obstructions that go to the It hasn't come up because the, that. Does she still suffer? She's, she's N of one. I don't know that we've had a two. Simply, we haven't gone looking for them. Um, so you think about treatment for hyperdoidal myopathy? Because some of these people have all the attention. Yeah. So you kind of, yeah, maybe we do want to upgrade with approval. Maybe a new lead would be a solution for them. Uh, other, other centers have done them, and I've seen, uh, yeah, other centers have done them now, and some have done a few. Um, the, the challenge is you can end up with Clipsam, if the posterior leaflet is also big or if everything is sort of moved anteriorly, you can get a beautiful clip result, and now the whole thing just sams. So in, in, no, because you, when you're still attached, you're tethered by the catheter. Oh, okay. So the mobility, the final mobility, you guess at, because um, yeah. you're still attached to a very thick catheter. It's when you finally unscrew and you let it loose, <coughs> and that's when you sometimes, you're like, oh, that's pretty mobile or looks awesome. It's not moving at all. So I don't know the algorithm for the decision making. Your patient was easy because she was high risk and sick and it was not, not surgery. So let's go for it. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'd like to see us do more, but they hadn't really come forward yet. Yep. All right, everybody. Thank you.